Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. Today I have Hugo Kruger here to talk about energy density and I think a bunch of other things. Uh, Hugo, could you introduce yourself? Oh, hi, uh, Tom. Thanks for the uh, for the invitation. So basically, my background is in structural engineering. That was my bachelor's degree with civil engineering. And then I moved, I came to France after working for two years in South Africa, I worked in the cement industry. Um, then I came to France to do a master's in, it was nuclear structural designs, a very niche field of um, structural engineering onto nuclear, sort of a combination of the two. And then uh, since then, I've been working on uh, for a variety of places, mainly on energy projects. So I worked at Hinkley Point, I've worked at ITER, the International Fusion Reactor. I've worked um, in the oil and gas industry in Russia um, on some of the Amal projects, which is very geopolitical. And at the moment, I'm working on offshore wind. So I am uh, not supposed to say anything negative about climate change to keep my job. You know? yeah. And then also, yeah, I just have a, a podcast where I cover um, a variety of topics. I started with uh, climate stuff. I did a bit of COVID. I... Um, I've been writing a lot on uh, social topics. I write a lot with Joel Kotkin, who is an American professor in uh, urban planning. Um, generally, what so it, it's all over the place, my writing. It's not necessarily related to what I do, but it's, I suppose my opinions are informed. And then also, I've recently been covering a lot of geopolitics. Um, for what it's worth, my wife is Iranian, and um, I'm very deeply concerned with the geopolitical standoff that has occurred with Iran and the United States and all these countries. So I've been covering a lot of that as well. But yeah, today, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to talk about energy density and then how I understand the climate debate after reading a little about it. And I've been writing about it as well. Um, it's going to be very similar to your conversation you had with uh, Michael Kelly. And I actually yeah. share some things of his presentation here because I, I have talked to him before. But um, I'm giving this from a civil engineering perspective and then just what is the implication of um, energy the energy transition. So I titled this, this uh, presentation I did for the Institute of Electrical Engineers beginning of this year, the Paris chapter, and it, it was a debate on energy density on nuclear energy. So I, I sort of make the case for nuclear here, and uh, you're going to see why very shortly. So basically, um, I'm just going to start with the thing here to say, what is the definition of energy? Now, this will be all learned in physics and school. Energy is the capacity uh, for work. But then there's an interesting quote from Richard Feynman where he said there's a fact, if you wish, a law governing all natural phenomena that are known to date. There is no exception to this law. Um, it is exact, uh, exact as so far as we know, the law is called the conservation of energy. Okay. It states that in no, there is a certain quantity, which we call energy, that does not change in manifold changes, which nature undergoes. But then there's another uh, quote from Richard Feynman, which seems almost contradictory, where he says it's important to realize that in physics today, we have no knowledge of what energy is. We do not have a picture that energy comes in little bobs of definite amounts. And what he means by the second quote is, you cannot see energy under a microscope. Energy is a derived constant. Okay, it's a constant in nature, but it's derived. You cannot observe it. So somebody says, you know, he feels energy, he sees energy. Um, no, it's uh, you can't see it. You can see light, which is maybe a f energy transforming to a, f a, a, a certain form. You can feel heat, but you can't really see energy. You can't. It's a derived constant, and that's important to realize. Then, as I said, my background is in structural engineering, so I always um, work to basic units, um, SI units, and so energy. It's joule. It's newton times meter. Okay, it's the same unit as a torque, basically. Then you have what is called power. Power is what? It's one joule a second. And that's Newton times meter per second. And then when we talk in electricity generation, we talk about it's you multiply the two out again. It's watt times second. You end up with joule. So when you say a turbine is working or when energy is being generated, work in the vernacular sense okay, is the same as work in the physical sense. It's one of the few places where physics and, and normal everyday talk lines up. So if you say a guy works, he's actually using, uh, um, we're we talking about joules, right? And I see the media confuse energy and power and electricity generation all the time. And these things are actually distinct. They've got distinct units. And to engineers, it's very frustrating reading the news, okay? So um, just a simple thing before the Industrial Revolution, okay? Rapid industrialization began in Britain. Okay, it started with mechanized spinning in the 1780s with high rates of growth of steam power and iron production in the 1800s. Because Britain had access to energy, okay, it was allowed to industrialize. That's what kick-started the Industrial Revolution. Before that, we used animals and slaves. Every society in the world used animals and slaves. It's not unique to the Americans. I know they like beating themselves up to it. South Africa had slaves. India had slaves. The Arab world had slaves. Okay? After we discovered energy, we realized that we can free the slaves. Okay? 
And the first country to revolt against slavery was Haiti in 1804 against Napoleon. And that's why the French gave away half of America. It's the worst land deal in human history. Napoleon might have been a good general, but he was a bad businessman. Okay. And there's a quote from Karl Marx um, that goes back uh, as the Industrial Revolution was taking place, where he said, "Wood was too inconsistent and uncontrollable. And besides, in England, the birthplace of, industri of modern industry, the use of water uh, power by pondered even during the man manufacturing age. And then as the 17th century attempts have been made to turn two pairs of milestones with a single water view, but the increased size of the gearing was too much for the water, which had now become insufficient. And this was one of the circumstances that led to a more accurate investigation of the laws of friction. So even Karl Marx, the communist, realized that, look, guys, we need energy. You can't live without it. Okay? And this is, by the way, quoted from Das Kapital. So it's about the only thing that makes sense in Das Kapital. Um, then just to show... Uh, this is from Vaclav Schmil about uh, what is it meant to transition energy? Well, energy transitions, first we had coal, then we discovered crude oil in 1950, and then natural gas in 1930, but natural gas only really kick-started off in the last 20 years. And that's been a major geopolitical shift. And we're talking about modern renewables. Anyone who tells you we're having a renewable uh, uh, um you know, a renaissance is talking nonsense, um, because only 5% in 2015 was renewable, okay, of the, of the world energy supply. Uh, and that renewable by the way includes hydro. Okay. So if you take that out of the equation, it gets much smaller. Then um, this is the proven uh, the known uh, uh, the proven known oil reserves. And what you find an interesting phenomenon here is that we're actually getting better at finding oil and natural gas. We have more resources available now than at any point in history. Okay. This is an economist's point of view. Engineers don't get this. It took me about two years to understand this as an engineer, because engineers seem to seem look at uh, um, resources as a stock and not a flux. If you take water, it's the most obvious example of a flux. This, we have the same amount of water since the Big Bang, but it changes form. You have sewage water, you have river water, you have to recycle that. And what do you do to do that? You need energy. Okay, so the access to resources have gotten better. The amount of oil in the ground means nothing. It's the means to extract it that matters. And that's why we have get it better. So how do you gauge that? You look at the price. The price of energy has gotten cheaper. Quality of living is going up. Okay, and this was uh, proven by uh, Julian Simon against Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich being John uh, Aldrin, I think, uh, um, this, uh, tutor. Paul Ehrlich, everything he's been saying has been wrong in history. We're not running out of people and we're not running out of resources. And just from a... Uh, uh, economist point of view, we have more resources than everywhere uh, th than ever before. As I say again, look at the think about the water cycle. If you think of resources, don't think of it as a stock depleting you. You're not going to get it then. Okay. So then I look at the impact of modern medicine, and this is a very controversial graph. I hope it doesn't get you deplatformed. But um, if you look at tuberculosis, deaths from TB came down almost. Uh, I think it was almost 60, 70 percent. Okay. And it's probably more 80, 90% before we discovered antibiotics. It is not true that antibiotics brought down disease. It's also not true that vaccines brought down disease. Okay, if you look at measles, measles deaths was down 90% before we started vaccinating. You can say that tiny little slope test due to the vaccine. I'm not getting into that debate, but it's clearly not possible to bring back this down disease before it. So what brought it down? And I put it to you that the five networks brought it down. Okay, it's transportation, electrification, water and sanitation. And then telecommunications, a new network, it probably had no impact on disease. But these five networks is what allows us to have a high standard of living. And an excellent book about this by Robert Gordon, the economist, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. Um, modern medicine only contributed to about 3% of life expectancy. Okay, We live 30, 40 years longer thanks to energy. Now, um, if you... The, the big issue here, and I think Michael Kelly message is telecommunications. We have this perception that um, the world has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Everything is getting fast. There's atoms. I can speak to you. There's a Zoom, et cetera. That is true in the digital world. It's not true in the real world. If you take the kitchen from the 1950s, the kitchen of my grandfather's parents um, and from your grandparents, uh, maybe a bit earlier, uh, what do you find? The only thing that's changed is a microwave. Everything else the same. So the real world has not changed that much. And this is something I would like to get into the head of, especially the guys at Silicon Valley. They have an idea that tech is going to bring everything. But the reality is we still use, we still build roads of bitumen. We still use cement. We still use steel. So even if we're going to transition energy, those, <laughs> the, 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 those materials are not likely to change. So um, just another uh, um, sort of caveat here that I want to throw in is, um, if you look at the greening of the earth, 
Okay, we know the earth has been gre getting greener, and um, I know skeptics are saying, or, or skeptics against this argument saying we're going to run out of nutrients. But the fact of the matter is, the majority of the greening occurred in China and India. It is not true that development leads to more de deforestation. The interior is possible. Why? Because we're going to denser forms of energy. If you use the energy more densely, you're using fewer materials per person, and that allows nature to recover. So the majority of the greening happened in India and uh, North America uh, and China. And some did happen in North America as well, because you guys industrialized before the race. And so in Europe, if you look where I'm from, South Africa, it's a mixed story. South Africa is the mostly the developed continent on the African continent. Johannesburg and Pretoria are some of the largest man-made forests in the world. But if you go to Natal, these areas that are highly impoverished, you find the browning of the earth. You find the same in the Sahel, you find the same in the Amazon, where people are still developing. It's expected. But where there has been development, voila, you go to what India and China is. That's why India and China is no longer as poor as they used to be. India is no longer the world's poorest country. It is Nigeria, or the country of the most poor people. Okay. Then there's always this quote that I like. I think it's Matt Ridley's quote, why are wolves increasing, lions decreasing, and tigers holding steady? Well, the argument is wolves are in rich countries, lions are in poor countries, and tigers come from middle-income countries. So we all want to live like wolves, basically. The sooner we get people to be richer, the sooner we can care about nature, and then everyone can panic like Greta Thunberg. Okay. So this is a graph from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. This is about where our energy comes from. And if you look at the amount of energy generated, a lot of that is lost through heat. Okay. We have 65% of all energy in the United States is rejected out of the system. Generating energy using a steam turbine is highly inefficient. You only get about 30% out of it, but unfortunately, that's the best we have. So uh, it's a, um, the reason why fossil fuels, why we love fossil fuels, is not because you and I are shills for the fossil fuel industry. It's because fossil fuels lose a lot, lose a lot less energy in their process. It is not about generating energy. It's about transporting energy, ultimately. It's about conducting heat. And that gives fossil fuels the enormous advantage that they have. So just a point, two thirds of energy is lost through degradation in the system. Okay, why do we use fossil fuels? And the answer is simply because they work. Um, if you look at methane, okay, which is natural gas and propane and all these lovely things, they have the optimal density between uh, by volume. They have a very high density by volume and mass. Hydrogen, all the consultants will tell you hydrogen has a higher density, specific density. If you take a gram of hydrogen, it's true, you can get more energy out of it. The problem is we don't transport in grams, we transport in volumes. And if you look at by volume, hydrogen has got one third of the um, ability of methane. So it doesn't matter. So I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll get, I'll get to hydrogen now. Okay. Then we have a question of electrical vehicles. Okay, so Elon Musk, uh, South African, I think is a bit of a bullshitter, to be honest, but uh, either way, he is, he's managed to convince the US to, to buy into his pyramid schemes. He believes we're all going to drive electrical vehicles. Well, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, the, this is the quote from Michael Kelly, where he said the total pump stories in the US will run the grid for three hours, while installed battery stories were running for five minutes. There's not enough batteries around to run the whole world at the moment. Maybe we get the materials, maybe we have to dig it out of it. Um, but we saw this in London. This was from the beginning of this year. The police force um, using electric vehicles is struggling to respond to crime because the batteries keep going flat. If the criminals have a fossil fuel car and you've got a battery car, you can't chase after a criminal. right? So we have to think about that. Maybe these things have some issues. Then hydrogen. This was ran in France 24, you know, that far right newspaper. And it basically said um, this was a, a, a calculation done by the um, astronomers. Nikol Koryat, in describing the numbers as dazzling. Now, if you look at Charles de Gaulle Airport, it's about the same size, I think, as John F. Kennedy Airport. Um, massive amounts of uh, airplanes going there every day throughout Europe. If we theoretically want to run all the airplanes on hydrogen, okay, uh, we would need wind turbines covering 5,000 square kilometers. I unfortunately don't have the square miles here, and I'm bad in conversion rates. Um, but, you know, it's a big area. If we do PV cells, it's 1,000 square kilometers. And if we use nuclear power, you need 16 nuclear reactors to generate the amount of hydrogen necessary for Charles de Gaulle Airport. That's just one airport, 16 nuclear reactors. France has 58 nuclear reactors in total. So it's almost a quarter of all nuclear energy is necessary to generate the hydrogen. Anyone who's talking about the hydrogen transition, I would like him to show me better numbers than these. Okay, Maybe we increase efficiency. Maybe it's not 60. Maybe we double efficiency. It's eight. Maybe we triple it, you know? We're still gonna have two to three nuclear reactors for one airport. It makes no sense to me. Why is that? Well, we can go back to the most obvious thing. Hydrogen does a problem with volume density. 
Now you're running into another issue here with hydrogen because of the volume density. If you want to uh, theoretically have an aircraft that runs on hydrogen, you have one choice. Either you kick out the passengers or you reduce the range. But you can't have both because you have a certain tank with a certain amount of volume. That's why for hydrogen fuel cells, all this stuff, it doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, um, I've been in the energy sector only for 10 years. And, um, so, you know, some people always know better than me. And there's always a bunch of fads. So the new fad is hydrogen. Okay, so yes, we, uh, we talk about energy density. So this is the amount of area that is required for a nuclear power plant. And you can see nuclear has got a small dot in terms of footprint. Now, the critics will say you can live underneath solar. You can put it on houses. We can use the space underneath. You can theoretically farm underneath it. Offshore wind, I'm constructing it. At the moment, the, the theory is there's a NIMBY attitude in Europe. People don't want it in their backyard, but we're going to put it in the deep sea. The wind is more constant. I've heard all these arguments. I say fair enough, but ultimately you need this amount of space, right? You can't walk away from that. You can maybe walk, you can maybe use the space underneath it. And that doesn't get into the killing the birds and all these other issues. Okay. So here is a contradiction that I would like economists to explain to me. Solar panels, we know, has uh, have fallen in price. That is true. Offshore wind has fallen in price. Yet when you look at household income, electricity in Europe, Denmark and Germany has got the most expensive electricity. If you look at France, which is mostly nuclear, it's right here in the bottom. Norway, which is mostly hydro. They're lucky because they have the geography. It's very low. And all the guys burning coal, which is supposed to be dirty and expensive, is the cheap, has got the cheapest household electricity in Europe. Why is that? Um, okay, maybe these things are oversold. Maybe generating electricity is not the same as getting it to your house. That is where the argument comes in. How do you get it through the transmission line? Grid integration costs, the levelized cost of electricity that everyone's using has been overused because it sells one component. It does not sell the integration to the entire system. So I'm highly skeptical of the numbers being thrown out. The critics have said to me, and I've listened to them as well, but look, Denmark and Germany is taxing it more to encourage people to save energy. Um, they're saying France still hasn't comprised in decommissioning, so the price is theoretically higher. There's a lot of what-ifs to this, but ultimately the fact is the French uh, public pays less per energy per unit cost in, for their household prices than Denmark and Germany. That's a fact. Where wind and solar makes a lot of sense to me, though, is for manufacturing. During the daytime, you can use it to get down uh, your rates. A lot of customers have been looking into that, so they try and beat your utilities during the daytime. Of course, the utilities complain because that eats into their revenue. So there's definitely a room for them. There's definitely going to be expansion. I'm not against them, but I'm thinking they oversold. Right. So these are electricity prices in Europe. And if you look at France, France still... I think comes up below the European average. This was 21 cents. I can't remember when this was, but 2020, yeah, there we go. Um, France is still below the European average. And you look, all the guys burning coal is at the bottom. Norway is selling oil and they're using hydro, okay? And all the guys with, with uh, wind and, and uh, solar is at the top. They have to explain to me why that's the case. Uh, maybe it's the natural gas they use to subsidize it, but I'm ultimately, if I'm a consumer, I don't care about your spreadsheet. I care what I pay in my pocket. Right. Uh, Germany's power mix is so something to think about. Of course, the way gener Germany uh, generates electricity, a lot of it comes from biomass and solar and wind, and it looks lovely. This was, of course, before Putin invaded Ukraine. Um, but if you look at actually what they consume in energy, not generation, you need to look at consumption, you find that renewables still make up a small percentage even of Germany. Mostly it comes from natural gas. Some of it is used for industry. You can't replace it. Right, nuclear power is still six percent. Is half of what I get from renewables. So um, again, this is something. This and this comes, by the way, from Clean Energy Wire. It's a renewable advocacy group. Advocacy group. I always try to get my graphs from sources that contradicts my narrative, in case I get it wrong. Okay. Um, so this is just a thing to look at. Energy production is not equal to energy consumption. It's very easy to produce energy. It's very difficult to get it on time when it's necessary to meet demand. Okay. This was the uh, beginning of this year, uh, 2020, January 2022, and this was in August. Okay, the war in Ukraine was gone. But Germany shuts down six remaining nuclear plants. The media is happy. And then six months later, the Dutch joined Germans and Austria and reverting back to coal. Okay. Doesn't seem to me that uh, shutting down nuclear seems sensible. Um, now, this is uh, my side of the world. Um, I say I'm based in France, but I'm actually from South Africa originally. Um, the Chinese premier is calling for more coal production. Okay, China's climate goal hinges on a 440 billion nuclear bailout. Interesting. Narendra Modi pledges net zero by 2070. India is only going to look at this at 2070. That's one sixth of humanity. It's obviously not a disaster if 2070 is there. 
Um, Nigeria, now take into account by mid-century, Nigeria, Nigeria will be more populated than the United States. Nigeria is going to displace the United States, the third most populous country. Well, Buhari wrote to, uh, I think it was Newsweek magazine, he said, climate crisis will not be fixed by causing an energy crisis in Africa. Right? Nigeria is considering investing in nuclear energy. Okay, so maybe maybe the guys without energy know something here. Um, and this is actually what's going on. So this graph on the right-hand side, like people who first look at that one, this is the demographic transition model. Now, if societies are in uh, agrarian states, you it's women tend to have, or families, you know, they use the more neutral, will tend to have six uh, children on average. Four of them die in, die in childbirth or from disease and all these things, and they survive with two kids. So they just replace themselves. As certain uh, countries start urbanizing, that first generation is where you see population expansion. It happened in the United States. It happened in the UK. It's happened in South Africa. It's still occurring in many parts in Africa. It still has to occur in Chad. They're still in the first phase. Um, it's already past peak in China. Then after population becomes urbanized, you see that the death rate of children falls down, but so does the fertility rate. And that's where population growth stabilizes, right? And ironically, populations get richer as they stabilize their growth. Okay? And then no, nowadays, people are worrying about this peaking graph going down, and we're worrying that populations are imploding. But um, either way, we are hitting, I think, 2.2 people uh, worldwide. So I look at population projections. This is from the United Nations. Take into account these are projections. Projections tend to be like prophecies. They can be overused. But either way, by the end of this century, four out of 10 people in the world will be African, four out of 10 will be Asian, and maybe one or two people together will be in North America and Europe, and Australia becomes a rounding error, right? So the argument I make here is what Europe and North America does, okay, you guys can fall into the ocean tomorrow. It makes absolutely no difference to the temperature of the earth. What matters is what's mattering in Africa and Asia. And I go back to this, the three most populous countries there are saying, coal, nuclear, we are not going to stop it. So in a certain sense, the Western world is becoming irrelevant. And I think a lot of what is happening with climate change is and it comes down to the U.S. in particular's inability to accept that the world is becoming multipolar. Um, America does not call the shots everywhere anymore. Whether that's good or bad, we can debate it. I mean, I, I happen to like a lot about American uh, leadership, but either way, it's just the fact that India is not, I mean, India, uh, India is training their own engineers and scientists at the moment. So is China. I see uh, Iran is making its own nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear plants at the moment. African countries are looking at nuclear. Uh, they're doing it with or without the best permission. 30, 40 years ago, uh, we needed money from the IMF and the World Bank. World Bank. Now we have our own money. We don't need it. Of course, we would like them as a partner on this. So I make the point that unless you don't care what's happening in Africa and Asia, you're not serious. So let's just look at the reality check of what's happening. If you look at the total energy consumption in the world, solar and wind, you can barely see it on a graph, right? Uh, hydro still makes up more than solar and wind, and this is other renewables, probably geothermal, all these things. The majority still comes from oil, gas, and coal. And uh, this graph from Michael Kelly, who suggested that for us to get to net zero, we need a pack of unicorns. Okay. So this is sort of my uh, uh, graph on the energy scene. Um, then I'm quickly going to go on what I understand about climate change. I'm not an expert. I've just interviewed a few people who are experts. And I have read a lot of books on this subject. But either way, and I've got a background in uh, nuclear, which at least allows me to understand radiation transfer. So I've got a little bit of a sense of this. And I've worked as an engineer on many projects. And I've seen how people can fall for their own models. And I think a lot of that is happening over here. So if you look at carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere, first of all, this graph that they all show you never starts at zero. It would look a lot better if it started if it uh, didn't start at zero. Okay, But either way, there's no doubt that CO2 has gone up. I think that's a fact, right? Then if you look at what Al Gore tells us, um, he would tell us, look at the CO2. It's more than before humans were on the planet, okay? But what they don't tell you is that 400 parts per million is 0.04%, okay? 400 divided by a million times 100% is 0.04. We went from 275, from 0 0.03, if you round it off, to 0 0.04 in 100 years' time. Now, to me, as an engineer, when I look at a system like that, I would call this a trace gas. But either way, um, the climate scientists don't think that. So what Team Panic wants us to worry about, if you take a geological time, is this small little slope here. Right? This is what all the panic is about. Now, if I look at the past climate, if I look at the EOC maximum, and I see no correlation in the past between CO2 and temperature, you can't tell me this relationship here. What do they do? They look at some slopes here. They say it's three out of four watts per, kilo, per, per meter squared. 
Maybe they're right. Maybe there's an argument for it. But either way, you have to admit that in the past, there was no correlation. In some cases, you had CO2 lagging temperatures. Now, it's rare for the cause to follow the effect in science. But either way, team panic is on this one here. So this is what uh, William Happer sent me. And I think it's one of the best graphs on the greenhouse effect. It's basically, if you look at the zero ppm uh, atmosphere, you've got this. If you add 400 ppm, you know, you get some warming, but if you go to 800, you get a lot less. Why? Because CO2 is logarithmic with temperature. So if we double CO2, we would get one degree if all else is health constant. So the assumption is the rest is going to come from water vapor. It's going to come from other way. I think very few people will dispute that if we double CO2 in the atmosphere, we should get some warming. Um, lowest is potentially 1%. Anything else is coming from other forces in nature. Now, I have an issue of positive feedback because to me, that seems to violate the energy conservation law. Um, but either way, uh, positive feedback, they assume that water vapor is going to basically release more water vapor and more water vapor, and it's ultimately water vapor that's going to burn us. So what does the global mean temperature anomaly mean? Okay, What is the average temperature of the Earth? Um, I take into account, I grew up in Pretoria, it's easily minus four in winter, and the same winter afternoon can be 80, 90 degrees. So we have a major range of temperatures. Okay, If you take the variation of, of the temperature that goes into the record, you find it variates between plus four to minus four. There's as many temperature changes going down as up. So does the increase in the average temperature have anything to do with the actual temperature that you observe on the ground? So how do they get the scary graph? They take this, the average of the variation, or the average temperatures, and they increase the scale. Right, And now we've got a scary graph over here. Now we can say there was the Aetis, and we can say this was aerosols, and we can go on and on and on. Now, interesting thing is if you look at the temperature record from, say, uh, 1920 or 1900 to 1950, remember, CO2 only became significant after 1950. You find it's about the same as from 1960 to 1990. And if you look at a small difference, you get to 0 0.25 degrees. So we're saying in one century, we got one degree warming. Half of that has to be natural because that's from 1900 to 1950. Now, of the other half, how much is natural? Now, the IPCC says at least half. They get to 0 0.25. Okay. So the IPCC is getting the exact same number that I have. And they, would never, they don't want to cal calculate what is the percentage due to CO2 and what is percentage due to natural variability. This, of course, assumes I've got a basis to say any of it is due to CO2. And given that the temperatures in the past didn't correlate, I'm highly skeptical of maybe something else isn't happening with the internal mechanisms of the Earth. Who knows? Okay. Then this, we know there's this difference between surface temperatures and satellites, and it's a long debate which one is more accurate, which one is better. This guy is not correlating with uh, radio sounds, but the satellite temperature does not show me statistically different, significant warming. Uh, the land temperature, you know, it does show something over here. When I spoke to Tony Hiller, he tells me there's corrections in the past. When I read NASA and I read the methodology, they say, but they can justify it. They've removed the urban heat island effect that made it colder. They say that people were counting temperature twice in the past, so it makes it warmer. So we have to correct for that and et cetera. So it and goes on and on and on the debate. Uh, I also question why you have not even half the Earth full of temperature stations. The counter argument to that is if you look at the covariant matrix, you can pick up the anomaly on that basis. And there's some argument that you can place 60 thermometers well located in the Earth and you can measure the anomaly. I'm aware of all these arguments and I say, OK, fine. I accept that. I accept a one degree, one and a half degree warming. But again, I do not see the, the alarm. I don't, I don't see what bearing that has on the average temperature that I experience. And if I look at the variation between temperatures, it doesn't tell me much. Right. Um, yeah, this graph, I think, is kind of irrelevant. It's just how the temperature changes of heat. Um, then the hockey stick. Oh, what a hot button topic. Don't ever ask a climate scientist to explain the hockey stick. Um, it goes on in circle. Um, but we know that Michael Mann essentially committed fraud. Okay, He messed up the principal component analysis. He mixed up tree rings. So we don't even know if the past record, you know, it looks like a spaghetti graph. Which one is it? Do you take the envelope? Do you take this? I don't know. There seems to be inconsistency in the proxy record. I can't get somebody to tell me what proxy record should I use, right? Um, some say ice cubes, some say sediment. Everyone, I think, now agrees tree rings are a mistake. Was the medieval warm period a local effect, a global effect in the past? There's a big debate about that. And then um, I get, this is my favorite one. Okay, So this guy over here is Nostradamus, right? And Nostradamus today, if he lived, he would have used a computer model. This is the RCP um, 8.5 scenario from the UN, okay, representative climate pathway. If we keep on burning emissions, we're all going to die. Well, if you look at what the 
International Energy Agency predicts, you will find that it's significantly less the pathway than the heating that the panic is based on. And we are probably hitting something between 2 to 4% at the end of the century based on current assumptions, assuming this integrity in the scientific data and none of the numbers are fudged and it's, the scientists have done their rigor and work. So again, I don't see what the alarm is about, right? Now, this girl on the right, this is relevant to a South African audience, but this is a, a, a prophet a says by the name of Nkwahusi. She was a Klosa prophet. Klosa is the click-speaking languages, and I uh, probably mix, mix up, mess up that pronunciation as well. And this uh, young girl predicted that they would defeat, that her tribe would defeat the British in battle when the British started annexing the Transkai. And to do this, the, she advised them to slaughter their cattle. Okay, so what they did is they drove all the cattle into the sea, and big surprise that they did not defeat the British in battle. They were actually conquered by the British. They had to go and work for the British, and they starved them of their livestock. So humans have followed prophecies in the past with disastrous consequences. Yesenkoism is another example. Eugenics is another example. Um, I think if we're going to follow unrealistic climate pathways, we're going to get very close to that, right? So this for, for, for comparison, the Zulus did not do it. And the Zulus was the first people to defeat the British in battle after the American Revolution with spears. They decided we're going to arm ourselves. So maybe that's a more sensible strategy. Anyways, um, yeah, this is just, again, the satellite or the temperature measurement, which one to use. Then there's something else that, uh, and I give credit here to Denis Rancourt. He argues that if you look at the um, basic radiation transfer model, Sort of the intensity of the, uh, um, the, the, the the watts per square meter coming out. The intensity it's equal to the albedo times the sun intensity minus the emissivity times the Boltzmann constant temperature. If you use this equation, and depending on what assumption you put into the albedo of the Earth and the uh, emissivity, when the if we don't have an atmosphere. So in arguments like he is arguing that maybe snowball Earth has a different albedo, and if you correct for that, his argument is that maybe um, the temperature without an atmosphere won't be 19 degrees. It will be warmer than that. I think he got to four degrees Celsius. And then based on that assumption, he said, but you know, the contribution of CO2 cannot cause the difference in heating. So the global thermal effect might be different. It's a different way of arguing this stuff. I also had a conversation with Ned Nikolov that argues something different. Um, I think he's a bit off the spectrum, but he argues that the Earth's temperature will be the temperature of the sun, of the, of the moon if there's no atmosphere. And if you take that one, he argues it'd be much warmer, right? And then he argues that there is no greenhouse effect. Again, th those things are a little bit, uh, I, I think even climate skeptics would, would question those things a little bit, but it's interesting thought experiments um, nonetheless. And yeah, what is all of this about? This is just sort of summarizing everything. The warming that we are supposed to panic about, you cannot pick it up on a household thermometer, right? All the models, all the pathways, RCP, cocky stick, whatever, medieval warm period, global warming, everything, you cannot do it. So I'm saying it's a bit of a team panic. And then just a practical solution to decarbonize without destroying ourselves. I've argued for, uh, um, uh, uh, for nuclear power. And one argument I make is if you look at the wildlife at Chernobyl, they're actually growing. Chernobyl is not a toxic wasteland. And there's a very good argument uh, in this book, uh, Radiation and Reason by Wade Allison. And he makes the argument, low dose radiation is not toxic. Okay, it is not dangerous. It's actually healthy and beneficial. Um, if you look at the rates of radiation and cancer in the United States, there's an inverse relationship. The more background radiation, the less cancer. It's not that radiation causes cancer. And he has given a very strong case that the linear no threshold model or um, you know, in science is probably one of the biggest mistakes um, in the last 50 years of science. Okay, We should actually be exposed to more radiation. We should um, reduce our radiation standards, the ALARA standards. I'm not saying let's be exposed to highly toxic radiation, but we make the argument that if we bring radiation um, standards to the level that is, uh, uh, you know, um, based on actual observation and long history of epidemiological data, we can make nuclear power much more affordable, and we can potentially, you know, decarbonize the energy system, um, you know, for those that are really panicking to a certain effect. I don't think you can truly decarbonize. But either way, that to me is, is probably the most, it's, it's the practical low-hanging fruit in all of this. France was the country that decarbonized the fastest. France produces 0.02% of the world's CO2. It's pretty much net zero, right? And the reason for that has been France had the MESMA plan, plan under Charles de Gaulle and Pierre MESMA, and they uh, built a bunch of reactors in a very short space of time. It cost the country a lot at the time, but the benefits paid off. They don't have to panic at the moment.
So, yeah, I think I'll end there with the presentation. We'll just go on for a talk. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that was tremendously good. Have you given that uh, many a time or no? Um, yeah. yeah, I gave it. No, I only gave it once, but I did prepare a little bit for it. Um, but I, I, I've sort of written about this as well in um, some of the articles of Jill Kotkin. and we sort of try and and, and and what we're arguing for is is generally just a, a common sense approach to climate and energy. Um, I find it very difficult to preach for the people in Africa, and I, I'm from South Africa. But uh, let's face it, the black Africans who are living in poverty and without energy and things of that sort, that, you know, they need to check their carbon footprint. You have John Kerry flying over there with his greenhouse spewing airplane. He says to them, guys, we are all in this together. Okay. Now, uh, these people are, first of all, food starved in many cases. There's nothing of agriculture. Right? Agriculture will increase your CO2. There's no energy. The students, the kids have to go to school and study at night by candlelight. There's no running water and electricity. And your concern is climate change. I, I find that so callous and insensitive. And yet that is active World Bank and IMF policy at this stage. Yeah. I mean, they're actively working to prevent them from uh, putting up fossil fuel plants, I guess. I don't know how they can yeah. get the Look, funding. It's, it's a question of funding. They, they're trying yeah. to use you know, these ESG scores and funding to try and be more climate uh, conservative, if you will. Okay. Now, the problem with that is, look, many African countries have bad debt ratings. Um, I am not praising African leaders by any means. A lot of them can manage their own economies better. And you know, the US has an argument to say, guys, if we're paying for it, you know, we want something in return and we want the climate policy. So in a sense, you're paying for that. The problem with that is though, the Chinese are stepping into Africa at the moment. And um, if the US is not gonna do it, the Chinese don't care about this stuff. They, they are opening a new scramble for Africa. So America is preparing themselves, or the Americans are preparing themselves for a geopolitical standoff with Africa. And look at the last vote against the Ukraine war, okay? Half of Africa said we are not going to side with the United States. A lot of it has to do with these type of policies. They are being received as a form of neocolonialism, right? And um, a lot of African leaders have started questioning it. So the, world, I, the African Development Bank president in 2015 said Africa will basically use coal. Okay, that's the Development Bank of Africa. It's, it's not a small fry. The South Africa's uh, energy minister this year came out and saying, why should we do what Germany is doing? Doesn't sound sensible to me to become geopolitically dependent on Russian gas. Um, Senegal's president said something similar. He said, we're not going to pay your carbon levy in Europe. If you don't want to buy our products, we sell to the Chinese, right? So you're seeing a, a, a skepticism growing on the African continent against any of these policies. And I don't blame those leaders for saying this because their consideration is poverty. Okay, it's geography. We don't even have enough adequate water supply in some areas. And you need energy, unfortunately, for that. So anything to develop Africa at this moment is going to be the likely choice and pathway. And um, again, I mean, our cities, I mean, Johannesburg's population doubled in 10 years after Mandela became president because everyone just flocked to the cities after the end of apartheid. We haven't absorbed all those people. We don't have the infrastructure. So uh, this is just not a concern on the African continent. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be a concern. In my opinion, it should not be a concern. It should be all about development and uh, raising their standards of living and getting good medical care, et cetera, and trying to prevent bad weather. I think that should not be at all a concern, but, but of course. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I mean, is the weather that bad? I mean, if I look yeah. at the extremes, I mean, I, I didn't put any of my slides. I can't see it, okay? No. I know some people have argued that heat waves might be getting more intense. And so maybe, you know, maybe they're right. But is it the end of the world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, I, I look at the skeptics against that. They say, but you're fudging the data and we don't have adequate data. And, you know, the arguments go on and on to me. The, the, the simple argument to me is just that if you're hungry, you don't care about any of this, you know. Um, right. I think that there's, there's something like 40, I think it's if you earn $40,000 a year um, net income, then you start becoming a climate activist. It's sort of like it's a rich yeah. kid's problem. <laughs> so if you, if you want more climate activists, you would help the development of Africa. <laughs> I know there's a lot of variability in the weather in general, depending on where you are in Africa, but I have seen data saying that even in the continent of Africa, cold weather kills a lot more people overall than hot weather, even in Africa. Yeah, so this yeah, whole look, idea I that, mean, yeah. South Africa's temperature is the same as France's. Um, I mean, it's sufficiently south enough. Um, we don't have snow because we don't have humidity. It's not because we don't have that, that temperature. We have snow in some areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, Kenya can be very cold in winter as well. Um, but, you know, if you have a heat flux, um, you know, it's supposed to go to the pool. I mean, I looked at, at proxy measures against its proxy, but so it shows that the tropics did not change that much, much yes. in the past. 
Now, the big problem I have is those on the political left, and I tend to actually be a little bit more in a Democrat camp, uh, you know, ironically. Um, you know, I've had a podcast of Noam Chomsky, for example, who disagrees with me this on this stuff. But um, they tend to say the global south is going to die from extreme climate. And I'm saying, but guys, if the temperature to pole difference matters, the global south is in the tropics. You know, so on the basis of the current assumptions, you, you just got it all mixed up. The only country that might get screwed about is South Africa. You know, because we're a little bit south, but everyone else seems to be fine to me. Right. Very good point. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, France. Are they sticking with the nuclear power? Or I thought I've heard that there's some uh, well, they, they insanity it there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it was politics. So uh, uh, Fr Francois Hollande was uh, president a few years ago, and he came in saying they want to phase out nuclear. And he set targets for, I think, 40% nuclear by 2030 or 40. It was, again, unachievable. And Macron, until 2018, was saying the same thing. Now he's changed his religion. Okay, But the problem is you didn't invest in stuff for that long. So the capacity factors of nuclear should be 90%. And France, they're running at 50 60%. So France might be actually one of the few countries we might need renewables to compensate for the aging nuclear that hasn't been maintained. Right. And, and, and we see this all over again, is that the activists against nuclear, they happen to advise the governments to get rid of nuclear, to de-invest de it. I mean, the U.S. energy subsidies, whatever you think of subsidies, I think only 1% or 2% goes to, ener to nuclear energy, right? The majority goes to renewables. And then fossil fuels, they fudge the numbers saying that emissions, you know, times social cost, cost of carbon. But either way, renewable, nuclear don't get a lot. So they defund it, and then they go and turn around and see how expensive the technology is. I'm like, well, we, yeah, you, you rigged the system from the beginning. So we saw some of that in France. Now public opinion is in favor of nuclear. But even if France were to fix its aging fleet or rebuild new nuclear power plants, because I don't think you can upgrade them that long. There's a lot of skepticism against upgrading them. Uh, France is running into an energy problem as well. So, so France's energy system, I know Schellenberger celebrates it, but it's not that great. Uh, there are they are issues here as well. So what is the stated reason, though? That why would they ever want to phase out their nuclear power? That it was working? just politics. It was okay. environmentalism. Yeah. Um, in, in Europe, being nuclear is dirty and dangerous to the environment. Think of the children decommissioning, okay. you know, all, all these type of things. This was sort of what happened a few years ago. Even Macron, as I said, until 2018, was singing it. And, and, and this is a problem in, in energy generation, is that um, the energy sector is not um, unsusceptible to ideology. Engineers themselves start believing nuclear was going out. I mean, I studied nuclear here. The engineers in the, uh, that was, was teaching me were saying nuclear is end, ending in France. We're not going to do it anymore. So, you know, when engineers stop believing it, what happens? The clever kids leave that industry, right? They work for Total, oil and gas, ironically. Um, and then the technology sort of gets dilapidated. So France at this stage, I don't know if they still have the expertise to build new nuclear power stations. Um, I worked in Hinkley Point in the UK and Hinkley Point... Um, I mean, that's that's a good example of how not to do nuclear. I think it's 10 to 15 years. Meanwhile, if you look at the uh, power plant in Dubai that the South Koreans are building, they built that one on in a very good time frame. And ironically, it was built by a lot of South African and American engineers, uh, while we can't build it in our own countries, right? So, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's not a question of not having the expertise even. It's, it's sometimes just a question that the politics need to align. And until you have an elite that buys into nuclear, that's acceptant of it, like we had in the 50s and 60s in the Athens for Peace movement, um, I'm very skeptical um, of the proponents of nuclear power. I, I'm in favor of nuclear power, but you need to, you ne you need to have a more broader buy into, uh, into it. But the dream in France was to take uh, working nuclear power plants and replace them with wind and solar. That was really the thing. I, I don't or, think they had a plan, to be honest. Okay. I, 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 they, that was sort of the idea. The, the idea was that they're going to start putting in more renewables because renewables have gotten cheaper, which is true. And, and by the way, it might even be a case that maybe 80, 90 percent nucleus is too much in France. Maybe you need some renewables in your system. Um, I, I have come around to accept that renewables can work, um, as I say, for manufacturing, for example, they're very good at getting the daytime cost down, right? So you can manufacture cheaper with more energy intensive. Um, they're very bad at nighttime. <laughs> um, the, the problem is how do you integrate all of these things together in the grid? And the guy smiling behind all of it is the guy selling natural gas because natural gas has the main advantage that it's dispatchable. So wherever there's a deficit in the energy system, you're just going to have to put the picking gas plant and you're going to compensate it. And whenever you see renewables, you always see ga the gas guy is sort of like funding the renewable lobby. And, and that's part of a deeper politics here. And, and, and that's also a thing. There's this there's a assumption that the fossil fuel industry is against nuclear uh, renewables. They're not. 
because they know that if the stuff doesn't work, if there's a geopolitical shock in the system, they're going to be the guys cashing in. So it's really not a threat to their interest. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Would you want to uh, talk about who else you've had on your podcast? You mentioned you've had, uh, who else? You had Richard Linden on there and yeah. Judith Curry. Yeah, the, the interview yeah. with Judith Curry, I think, was the, the most um, revealing one to me because um, I, I do computer modeling as well for a living. Um, so I've got, a, I mean, it's, it's on structural elements and engineering stuff, but I've got a good sense of how these models work. And I am skeptical because there's a few... The first problem is I say skepticism without having evaluated the model. Okay, so that's not fair really to the modelers. But what makes me a little bit skeptical is the model solved the Navier-Stokes equation. Now, if you know anything about fluid dynamics, there is no analytical solution to the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, it can only be solved by parameterizing it, by putting it on a grid and then solving each point on the grid, basically. Now, the problem with that is how do you verify um, your results, right? And it seems to me that one way of, of getting around that is trying to fudge it to a known temperature record. So the models are seeded with a temperature record. That makes me a little bit skeptical of the whole endeavor. The thing is, um, they also say they use um, spectral calculations, Fourier transfer, so it's sine waves and cos waves in the X and the Y plane. And in the vertical, they use finite differences. Now, uh, Fourier transport is not an issue, but finite differences to me is a big issue because um, when you use a finite difference calculation, you're basically having a time step, right? You add a new time to the grid. You don't have a converging solution and you sometimes miss a convergence point. So when I look, go into just what I know about structural models and the issues we face with it, and then I take those critiques against uh, um, climate models, I, I, I can get a little bit high tech. I'm, I'm highly skeptical of their ability to perform. That being said, I haven't done the modeling, and maybe I assume maybe the models have got integrity. Um, also, uh, another point that goes missing is one reason this climate sensitivity is the assumption of aerosols. Uh, we don't know how much aerosols will be in the atmosphere, and aerosols tend to cool the planet, for example. So th that's how they explain the range to me when I talk to some modelers. Um, you know, again, it's it, it's a model is as good as your assumptions that you put into it. Maybe they're good, maybe they're not good. My, my argument is that. I'm, a, I'm willing to accept the argument that the scientists have integrity. I've, I've spoken to some people on the Alama side and they tend to be worried about this thing. Um, I don't see the panic, but more importantly, I don't see the engineering solution you know, coming out of this uh, to decarbonize the world while simultaneously developing the, the, the developing world. And maybe that's where I fall into the camp of Stephen Kuhn and it says, let's just adapt to climate. It's much more proportionate. Every country can go in its own pace. Um, and you know, maybe that's the best trade-off we have at the end of the day. It sounds really good to me. sounds smart to me. Let's see. What else should we, we be covering here? Um, well, I, I think a part of this is also the political economy of this thing. Um, we touched a little bit about that of geopolitics. Yeah. Uh, wherever there's energy, there's geopolitics involved. So I'll give you an example. As soon as the U.S. became energy independent, the next day, Donald Trump announced the U.S. withdrawal of troops from the Middle East. Right. So there is an argument that, um, you know, the propaganda and the stuff, it's funded by a variety of interests in, in, in all of this. I mean, the U.S. is not the only player here. The Germans, the, there was accusations of anti-fossil fuel um, uh, or anti-fracking lobbying being funded by the Russians and by the Chinese, for example, or by Qatar. I mean, Al Jazeera is a very pro-climate change um, newspaper, yeah. you know but they're funded by Qatar that gets most of its energy from gas. Why? Because it's convincing the Westerners to not go for their own gas resources. And then basically they get the other side of the market. And you see this over and over again. I mean, the coal lobby do the same thing in South Africa where we, um, we extract uh, our petrol from coal. We do gasification. It's a very energy expensive process and it's been subsidized by the government. And we, it's oh. probably cheaper just to import coal, but then they make the argument of energy security, energy sovereignty, right? That might be oh. true. But simultaneously, it's also you trying to regulate and capture a market. And a lot of this stuff to me is just follow the money, I think. All right. I did not know that. At, they're doing that at scale right now in South Africa. They're making a lot yeah. of their gas. Yeah, the, the, the reason was okay. when, um, when the apartheid regime was sanctioned, South Africa was worried that it was going to not be able to import oil because we don't have a lot of oil. We have a lot of coal. And then we said, okay, well, we're going to invest into converting coal to oil. So we're one of the few countries that have a, a company, Sassel, South African, I think South African Stimulate Willie. So it's coal out of oil, translate from Afrikaans. 
and um, basically it's just to yeah, to have petrol all over the country. So we are, we actually produce it from coal. And the African continent is full of coal, by the way. So that's a process you can really domestic, uh, domesticate. I'm not so sure if you can export it. It's, it's, it's still an expensive energy intensive process. But either way, um, yeah, that, that sort of thing happens all over the energy sector. Um, I find it very difficult to accept the argument of those arguing for, in favor of a free market for energy, because all energy sources ultimately are subsidized, even fossil fuels. I mean, one big uh, subsidy for fossil fuels has been the wars in the Middle East. The U.S. military is one of the biggest buyers of fossil fuels. So, you know, the critiques against that have been correct, I would say. Um, but simultaneously, the guys selling renewables tend to get their money from anti-fracking lobbies at times. You have Greenpeace, who one of the guys advising the French government, right, to get rid of nuclear. Why would Greenpeace do it? Well, they get money from the guys selling solar panels. It's not complicated, this stuff. Right. So yeah, I, I've seen a lot of this um, working on various projects. And ultimately, as an engineer, you know, my loyalty is first to the public structurally. So first of all, these things need to be structurally safe. They need to be built to best practices. Um, they should be environmentally friendly in the sense that they shouldn't have a leakage or anything of the sort. So we try and life cycle analysis, all these things. And um, one big critique I have against the metrics being thrown around is they do not apply all the full life cycle analysis to everything. So nuclear power, for example, has to be over-regulated to an extent. Um, you have to look at decommissioning costs. You have to look at all these things. But those arguments are never made for solar panels or wind panels. They're never even made for fossil fuels, right? So you, you find a lot of this in the political economy as well. I do think in the US, there's a lot of fudging when they're talking about the alleged subsidies for fossil fuels. I've yep. heard that just some normal uh, accounting procedures that every other company would use, they call that a subsidy if you can write off capital well, costs. Well, one one, one yeah. thing they get away with yeah. is the, they, they take the amount of emissions and then they multiply that by the social cost of carbon. Yeah. And they say that's a subsidy because you're right. damaging the environment. Now, the problem is what is the price of the social cost of carbon? Mm -hmm. Economists vary from $10 to $150. Now, depending on what your politics is, you will obviously try and inflate that number. So that, that to me is not a subsidy. The, the big subsidy in the US is that the military spending is never taken into account when they talk about it. And there is a big case to make that, I mean, if you really care uh, about fossil fuels, the US military has a bigger carbon footprint than the African continent. Mm -hmm. Okay. But do you think the Americans are going to stand for decarbonizing the energy system, the, the military? No. So <laughs> the military is not, not accounted in yeah. this, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I don't think any country would do that. Yeah. Uh, my argument is that there should be no so social cost of carbon. I think it's a benefit. I think more yeah. CO2 in the atmosphere is a benefit. And a little more warming is also a benefit. So if you're going to so calculate I, I a cost, caution, it should be negative. Yeah. So I, I just caution against that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, I know of the greening of the planet, and that's a benefit, mm -hmm. and there's an increase yeah. in, in, in food yield. And I agree with all of that. There are some scientists who say that we might run out of nitrogen and nutrients. And in some areas, I know in the Sahel, some people have made that argument. So I don't know. Um, maybe we should emit nitrogen as well. So the plants have both of them. <laughs> you know, and, and definitely, you know, CO2 favors certain plants over others. Mm -hmm. So we might change the biome. Is that the end of the world? I don't think so. You know, but, but, but ultimately, how do you price these things? I, I don't know. If we get more economic growth at the end of the century, maybe that's a sensible trade-off, you know. We can, and is there really that much warming? I, I don't see it. No, I think the whole fundamental assumption that a 280 ppm world is way better than a 600 ppm world. I think that basic assumption is wrong. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. But, but okay. But my argument is then, yeah. what is the level of CO2 that you will accept? What is when are you yeah. saying, okay, guys, now it's toxic, you know? And yeah, yeah. I mean, I asked Patrick Moore that that I like to ask people that he said optimum is maybe 1500, and that's okay. what's in a greenhouse. Uh, so. I think uh, we should not be worrying at all yet about too much CO2 in the air. Right. Okay. Yeah. But uh, just again, the greenhouse, um, people yeah. also add nutrients. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't have a certainty that answer. Just um, yeah. look, should we invest into technologies that are maybe low CO2 or something of the sort, and maybe we just throw money at it? I'm not against that necessarily. So I, I give you a good example. One way place where solar panels are becoming really good is the desalination of seawater. Um, you can put them on small towns that have a very, um, basically nobody coming part of the year, and then they can use the excess sun to store it into hydrogen. So they have a water source next to it, and they can try and use that for desalination. And there has been cases, I think, in Australia where Melbourne has gone that route, and they have 
reclaim some of the rivers because when you desalinate seawater, you don't use your inland rivers that much and they can recover. So, you know, there is a sensible application. Another sensible application is heating water on Africa. We've got lots of sun, so there's no argument against that. So I, I'm in favor of these technologies to the point where they make sense. But what I'm really skeptical of is what Germany is doing. It, it just seems to me religiously fanatical. And, and maybe we should talk a little bit about that because we wrote an article about just the cult of, of this whole thing. It's, it's just like people obviously don't know what they're talking about. And then they, they're going bazookas over, as uh, you say, a few ppm of CO2. Yeah, I've heard the argument somewhere that there's guilt in Germany over World War II and somehow they're to, a, <laughs> to make themselves feel better. They're saving the planet. I, I've heard that multiple places. I don't know if there's anything to that well, argument. I, I mean, all religions preach guilt. One, one yeah. argument is that uh, Europeans tend to be less religious than the Americans and the Africans. And therefore, you know, humans just have a religious instinct yes. and we need to feel guilty about something. So your carbon footprint, checking your carbon footprint is the new Ten Commandments, maybe. There's, maybe. <laughs> there's something like, there, there is definitely something of this. I mean, I don't know. Um, in, look, the environmental movement has always been a little quasi-religious, even before CO2 became a thing. And it's just that this cult has always been with us. And there's a very big Puritan strand in the UK, for example. But I mean, I look at these kids. Um, and, and by the way, what got me into this whole story is um, I was working at ITER, in the fusion reactor, and we were discussing at the time a bunch of scientists and me, the engineers, and sort of just having a little think over the rugby game, watching rugby, having a beer and talking about the science stuff. And we were talking about um, fusion, you know, should you have magnetic confinement? Should you have inertial confinement? You know, what is the best way to achieve nuclear fusion, which is a very expensive process. We don't even know if it's going to work, et cetera, et cetera, and all the arguments. And um, for one reason or another, the argument went to global warming. And I said, well, I think this thing is nuts. I, I, I didn't think it was just an instinctive reaction. I didn't know anything about it. And that's exact same scientist who was so heavily engaged and open about fusion and whether we're doing the right thing and everything went crazy on me. I, I provoked like a religious attack, like how dare I question the science, you know? Yeah, so we've just yeah. been doing it and, and it just got so infuriated. Anyway, this was a young kid, which was, I think at the time was 23, 24, you know, young man. And that disturbed me a little bit. So I, I thought, but what is this about? You know, this is a scientific theory and I have a right to be wrong and, you know, all these things. And that's how I, I sort of, that was sort of my first gay into it. Then secondly, I did a re-evaluation study for EDF, Electricity de France. We had a contract with them to look at the impact of hurricanes on nuclear reactors, right? Which makes somewhat sense. So we had a small steel structure and they said, okay, we're going to pilot it, just do a small analysis and see what the cost will be. And it ended up, you had to replace a few bolts to you know, tie down the forces. But then I asked my manager, but hurricanes in France, I'm not sure if we have them. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just recently arrived. So I looked it up and the last heavy storm was in the 70s and one old lady died. And I, I went to my boss and I said, well, why are we doing any of this? It just, it just didn't add up. And, you know, he, he took me off the team because, you know, I was uh, questioning the science. <laughs> so anyway, that, that type of stuff happens all the time. Um, uh, and anyway, so in France, they, they, this is one reason, by the way, why nuclear is getting expensive is because they're reevaluating all these things against a lot of extreme aggressions. And I'm not sure if we're going to have any of them. So okay. you're trying to you know, all, add up all these upgrades and safety standards. So that was also what got me into the thing. And then from one wing and another, I went, I started the podcast and I questioned the science. And I suppose now I'm a skeptic slash denier, you know. Glad to hear it. Okay. Uh, what else should we cover here? Might be at a good wrap up point here. Or yeah, have... um, yeah. I, I would say the one thing that disturbs me the most about this whole story is um, just the way that children are being propagandized into this thing. Now, I study German as well. I'm a German and a French speaker as well, in addition to English. Um, and I study a lot of the propaganda of Nazi Germany. I've studied a lot of the propaganda of the apartheid regime. The way that these kids are being are going on, the just oil guys, they are no better than Mao's Red Rebellion. They're no better than the Hitler Jugend. They're no better than the apartheid storm yards. Every regimes in the past, or in Iran, they had the crazy fanatical Basij guys as well. You know, it's not unique to one society, but there's, there comes a time where people are just radicalized. And it really disturbs me when I see young kids who think they've got no future, okay, when all the trends in the past is that the world's getting better. And they, they are scared because of nonsense that adults are telling them, essentially, right? Who, who don't even understand what they're talking about. You know, I, I, I was the other day, I, I was seeing a vegan march in Paris. So people were really protesting against meat. And I asked the one guy over there, can you tell me the average temperature of the earth? He didn't know the answer. Okay, but he's convinced we need to stop eating meat. So 
I, I, I'm not sure how to handle that issue, but the uh, fanaticism has always disturbed me. You know, people that, that take things too far. And, and here we're seeing a good example of that. Yeah, definitely. No kid should ever lose sleep over this. That makes me sad that any kid cares about this because. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, 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 and this is sort of the answer to all of this is um, I the, the most interesting conversation I had was with uh, Mark Crispin Miller, who's a professor in propaganda at New York Studies. And, you know, he makes the argument that the climate narrative has got all the same propaganda features as um, you had in the wars on terror. You know, it's the exact same people sometimes that are propagating it. Um, it's an idea that, that comes sort of selectively feeded from Congress. The science is settled. And the purpose of propaganda ultimately is to not have an argument. Like that, the propaganda is not to persuade you. It's to dissuade you, to sway you away from the conversation. And one way to do it is all the scientists say, yes. you know, yeah. the hockey stick is settled, you know, things of that sort. That is a clear sign that you're dealing with propaganda. And climate change, whether the, I think the science has become secondary to the political narrative. Um, it, it's, it's very obvious to me. And this to me is just another form of propaganda. And I think it needs to be, you know, sort of exposed. Very good. All right. Well, we'll have to keep working on exposing it. And uh, I think we're good for now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tom. Okay. And yeah. good, good, it's good being on your show and please keep up doing what you're doing. I really enjoy your conversations. Thank you very much. Okay. I really enjoyed this. And uh, I guess I'll talk to you next time then.